This is the first part in a series analyzing the feasibility of biochemical and genetic augmentation of the human body, using established precedents in ethics and scientific conduct, while investigating emergent theories in bioengineering. The physical modification of human beings implies a range of ethical problems, not only in the specific act of modifying human DNA and changing natural structures of the human body, but in preparing individuals for augmentation and communicating these processes to society at large. The science and implications of modifying human RNA and DNA are more relevant than ever, as we for the first time in history are deploying man-made organisms with recombined mRNA in our bodies on large scales and in a generally publicly endorsed way to combat viruses. Human genetics in modern society are a closely attended to individual aspect of life, protected by medical consensus as well as legal and civil protections. While we have dedicated great resources to understanding the human genome, we consider it a sacred and unassailable aspect of the individual. The scope of technological potential has today outpaced our rational and ethical conclusions when it comes to human DNA, and this is consistent with the history of genetic research. The science has always been a step ahead of our preparations as a society to deal with species-altering technologies. Today, a multitude of inexpensive mail-in genetic analysis kits exist, exemplifying how important our individual genetic history has become and how accessible they are to many. In exception to this apparent confidence our species has for peering into our most personal and functional human framework, we actively choose not to tamper with our own genetics. Yet, we benefit every day from many organisms which have been genetically modified under human discretion. At specific junctions in modern history, the scientific community has reached dramatic and influential conclusions regarding the handling of not only actual human genes, but also those potentially gene-altering technologies we have recently discovered. Today on Demystifying, we'll begin to tell the story of modern science's relationship with human augmentation from the first crucial milestone, the Estilamar Conference of 1975 and beyond. Before moving forward, let's recap what recombinant DNA or rDNA is. This is a term used to describe the biological product of a human technology which utilizes bacteria or more complex cells, such as yeast, to introduce modified genetic material into living cells. This technology allows us to introduce specific genetic sequences into simple cells and tailor their function to specific needs. Recombinant DNA biotech is applied widely in medicine, agricultural production, industrial fabrication, and many fields of scientific research. Although widely utilized, this technology is notably not acceptable when applied to humans directly, although we use our DNA-produced organisms for numerous medical applications. The core problem holding back the expansion of genetic testing in humans is largely based in a few simple but powerful notions. Genetics is today a highly relevant topic with heavy weight, and this is why ethics and human augmentation go hand in hand at all levels of application, from laboratory experiments to societal implementation. There is also the question of modifying non-human genomes using the rDNA method, a question we have answered in our decisions as a society. Unlike humans, the precedent in non-human organisms has been established by the scientific and commercial world as being largely acceptable, although these applications are typically the guarded intellectual property of large corporate entities with strong interest in maintaining their legal obligations to extant precedents. Humans are the only organism we continue to fully protect from the greater implications of genetic modification today. The Estilamar Conference of 1975 was a deterministic event for the reality we face now in human genetics, and also the first crucial milestone for the future of human augmentation. We'll begin our discussion of the 1975 conference by turning the clock back to the summer of 1971, where experiments on simian virus 40 or SV40 were planned by Dr. Paul Berg, pioneer of recombinant DNA. Berg was the first scientist to successfully splice DNA from one organism into molecules from another, and by 1971 started looking to specific viruses to facilitate this process. Simian virus 40 would eventually be employed towards these ends. This virus previously gathered attention across scientific communities, as it was believed to be a contaminant in a large number of polio vaccines distributed in the middle of the 20th century. It was known to cause problems in rhesus monkey biology, an animal which hosted the dormant virus. 
Only monkeys with weakened immune systems or smaller animals such as rats would develop SV40-related health problems, ranging from kidney disease and nervous system damage to brain tumors. SV40 was long recognized as a tool in molecular biology to study DNA replication and transcription behavior. It is today usually considered not a major factor in causing cancer in humans without exposure to other powerful carcinogens in conjunction. But the possibility of this virus increasing cancer risks in humans is and was then a real concern. In 1971, this relationship of SV40 with increased cancer risk in humans was only vaguely understood by the scientific community, and they responded to this unknown appropriately by halting further research using the SV40 virus. Two years later, a meeting of the Gordon Research Conference on Nucleic Acids was held. One of the most hotly debated topics at the conferences was the danger posed to lab workers who came into contact with SV40. Dr. Maxine Frank Singer, one of many key names in molecular biology, was the National Institute of Health chairman at the 1973 Gordon Conference. Her discussion at the conference of the potential dangers to laboratory personnel from SV40 experimentation drew institutional attention to the topic and highlighted the need for caution in moving forward with these technologies. Dr. Singer was part of a special committee consisting of National Institute of Health and National Institute of Medicine experts tasked with studying the use of SV40. Her words speak for themselves, and what follows is her recounting of the debate in light of its implications. The cause of the excitement and enthusiasm is twofold. First, there is our fascination with an evolving understanding of these amazing molecules and their biological action, and second, there is the idea that such manipulations may lead to useful tools for alleviation of human health problems. Nevertheless, we are all aware that such experiments raise moral and ethical issues because of the potential hazards such molecules may engender. In fact, potential hazards exist in some of the viruses many of us are already studying. Other problems will arise with hybrid molecules we are contemplating. Furthermore, these hazards present problems to ourselves during our work and are potentially hazardous to the public. Because we are doing these experiments and because we recognize the potential difficulties, we have a responsibility to concern ourselves with the safety of our co-workers and laboratory personnel as well as with the safety of the public." End quote. This portion of the conference concludes with a vote from all participants to distribute a letter to major academic publications calling for a suspension of further research on rDNA experimentation. This is an event with no parallel in the history of science, and we should note the vote was hardly unanimous. The appeal held enormous weight and would become a rallying declaration that rDNA research is not only going to advance very soon, but it will advance fully disclosed with every interest of the public in mind. Consider also the contextual aspects of this event. Although this was a scientific conference without strict legal implication or journalistic coverage, the presence of the National Institute of Health in assembling a committee to review the discussions was a clear step towards a true public policy on our DNA use. The National Institute of Health not only directly supported our DNA research at this time, but had established its own working committee to oversee the discussions to stem from the 1973 conferences. While the NIH is an independent nonprofit, much of the research being performed was at the behest of the U.S. government, and so close attention would be paid to the safety and public health aspects of these developments. However, the Conference on Recombinant DNA did not serve to enact restrictions on experimentation or limit them. They merely urged a suspension of research until proper and thorough guidelines for safety could be established and enacted. Shortly after the conference, this technology was commercially realized and implemented by Genentech Incorporated in producing the first human insulin. Consider at this time, the public had little awareness of rDNA research nor its mechanisms. A major mishap in the field of genetics using this extremely powerful and mysterious technology could have produced a public backlash worse than even a nuclear weapons accident. Such is the power of mobilized human fear when applied to biomechanisms society simply does not yet fully understand given their limited exposure to it. The 1973 Gordon Research Conference in summation was a moment for the scientific community to state its self-awareness over the risks of rDNA use and to shed light on the reality that at the time this was an unregulated field of research. 
The participants insisted that changes needed to occur for the safety of all, and for the first time in history, scientists comprehensively halted their own research over concerns how influential and truly new this biotechnology was. Some two years later, the Asilomar Conference on Recombinant DNA Molecules would meet to discuss and publicize the work done towards our DNA safety guidelines and report the state of continuing research. The tone of this meeting is exemplified by the choice of words made in the meeting's summary statement, a published paper outlining the meeting's key points. Take the following statement, for example. The participants at the conference agreed that most of the work on construction of recombinant DNA molecules should proceed provided that appropriate safeguards, principally biological and physical barriers adequate to contain the newly created organisms, are employed." End quote. The gravity of this phrasing is quite apparent. These are unique life forms made by man to accomplish goals we set for them, and they are capable of wreaking unintended havoc on varying scales if misused. The major strategies for safely advancing our DNA study were laid out at the Asilomar Conference in two main categories. They were educational goals and application of newly standardized risk management protocols. These protocols themselves were not groundbreaking. Proper sterilization, clean rooms, and careful monitoring would suffice to keep our DNA experiments safe and routine. The Belmont Report of 1979 offered everything the public needed to adapt to the rapidly evolving situation of human biomedical research. It provided the necessary legal references to establish a precedent on ethical human scientific research, and is often cited along with such dramatic historical events as the Nuremberg Trials, in which the human experimentation performed on unwilling subjects during the Second World War under distressingly ideological circumstances were criminally prosecuted in an international court. The Belmont Report provided definite legal implication in furthering human augmentation and set the ethical groundwork for practical human modification going forward. Ensuring further moves into research on humans would be aligned with a common set of ethical principles. The Belmont Report featured three primary talking points. The applicable definitions of medical practice and scientific research, a simple assessment of ethical principles, and the prescribed methodology for applying human modification. The report discusses the delineation of medical practice and research by acknowledging they often occur simultaneously, especially with new procedures and technologies. It deepens this distinction by noting treatments considered experimental may not align with working definitions for laboratory experiments, those strictly technical in nature and inappropriate for practice on humans. By touching on how the term research and experimentation often change in definition, the report implores us to exercise care when using these terms and also to draw attention to how we perceive the viability of experimentation in medical practice. The report distills the ethical quandaries of this debate into three broadly accepted notions. Firstly, the ability of the subject to act in self-determination is crucial while they must also exhibit a constant level of autonomy and awareness, signifying a complete ability to comprehend their involvement in tests. Secondly, the Hippocratic maxim of the medical world, do no harm, must be employed while also realizing human judgment is not perfect and medicine poses inherent risks to health. It therefore urges a mirroring of the Hippocratic maxim with the practical framework it implies in the real world. To one, do no harm, and to maximize possible benefits and minimize possible harms. These ideas are distinctly complementary and not mutually exclusive. Finally, the report prescribes methodology for subject selection and assessment. It poses interesting considerations, such as the cost-benefit of technologies on a consumer level, ensuring these technologies are not self-serving to a specific and exclusive group facilitating their research, and in securing the availability of any benefits to society overall. Equal treatment may not always be possible due to real-world problems, but when it is not an option, the reasons for this inequality must be investigated and explained. The Belmont Report has outlined a framework of definitions and principles for proper conduct in experimental research on human beings. It realizes these ideas in the document's final section regarding applications of discussed ethical principles. They are 
informed consent based on information, comprehension, and voluntariness, assessment of risks and benefits based on the nature and scope of a specific research approach and a systematic method, and selection of subjects with intentional awareness of and a measure of consideration towards injustice along with any quote, social, racial, sexual, and cultural biases institutionalized in society. It is pointed out that an active effort must be made to prevent groups of people undergoing medical care who may be vulnerable or marginalized from being burdened with unfair selection. This is to combat the use of convenient test subjects who are more easily accessed by medical administrations due to being very ill, institutionalized, economically disadvantaged, or belonging to oppressed racial minorities, all historically vulnerable groups in medical research. The Belmont Report takes a particular stance on social experiments. Consider this excerpt from the document's footnotes. Because the problems related to social experimentation may differ substantially from those of biomedical and behavioral research, the Commission specifically declines to make any policy determination. The Commission believes that the problem ought to be addressed by one of its successor bodies." End quote. Our discussion of rDNA technology does not specifically imply modification of human DNA in practice. It is usually considered a tool for producing tailor-made organisms for performing specific tasks. Attempts at modifying the nucleic acid instructions of living human cells would come later with the rapid advance of mRNA technology. This technology has more far-reaching benefit to solving the most crucial human health issues, including cancer, AIDS, and degenerative diseases we associate with aging. These pivotal events of the 1970s set the stage for human augmentation going forward, outlining a practiced format for constructive scientific discussion of biotechnology in humans. It also provides an insight into how powerful precedents are in the medical and scientific community, whether they are universally agreed upon or not. As we continue this series into the modern day and beyond, consider how we apply our ethical reasoning to both historical events and the many unrealized technologies of great promise. As always, thanks for watching and thank you for supporting the channel.